and he got shot in the back. The round went right underneath the plate. It came out the front and it hit, actually hit the front plate and went out. As we turned him over, you can see his guts literally out. Uh, my name is Trinidad. I was in the U.S. Army. I did four years and I got out as an E-5. I signed up to be infantry and I was uh, selected to be a mortarman when I got to basic. Okay, I was born in L.A., East L.A., and I was raised in Long Beach. Most of my childhood, I grew up in, in pretty much uh, kind of poor in apartments, but uh, really strict parents, actually uh, religious strict. Growing up, I had a lot, I had a, had a lot of shit with my mom um, because uh, of how she was. So growing up, growing up in Long Beach, it's uh, pretty diverse as far as like uh, uh, there's a lot of Hispanic, there's a lot of like immigrants, like Asians, Cambodians, Vietnamese, Samoans. There's a lot of African Americans, and so we're all just kind of like thrown into the into the mix. And uh, every, literally every race, every culture is literally just trying to get ahead, but in their own way, just kind of going at each other. So growing up, for sure, I definitely fell into that. That definitely was part of a crew. If you're out by yourself, you're an easy target. So it's, it's one of those things where you do it to survive, you do it to, um, to just kind of get ahead, that we just kind of would mob the street. You know, we'd get into some goon shit here and there. Um, and uh, that landed me in a lot of trouble at home to the point where like my parents had to take like drastic measures to make sure that I would not uh, fall victim to the street life. You know, I got a family member that did fall victim to the street life and I had a cousin who was like a couple years older than me. I was, I was 14, he was 16. And so I like looked up to this dude, like literally like wanted to be like him and shit. And we lived on the same street, down the street from each other, went to the same school. And so pretty much whatever he was doing, I was doing. We throw ditch parties at, you know, and uh, just one day I volunteered my house to be a ditch party spot. And uh, um, more people showed up than anticipated. More people showed up that, that I got invited. And it ended up really a big deal. Um, fucking uh, cops showed up. Uh, people were passed out drunk. Uh, it was it was crazy, and it was like it was. My neighbors were all fucking shocked. You're in high school. You're doing everything. You, you know, you're trying to get laid. Fucking, you're drinking. You're fucking smoking. People started noticing. And uh, think of one time there was this uh, there was this girl being uh, carried out. She was passed out. She was being carried out to a car, and and I, that's what got the attention of people. That's what that's what people called. So fucking cops came, fucking everyone just fucking scrambles out the backyard to the front. I happened to be outside the front of the house trying to like make sure everything was all right. As I'm outside, the cops are pulling up. I'm the first one they get. Fucking, uh, yeah, man, helicopter came in that night, that day too. Um, it fucking, some of my friends got away and some of them didn't. Um, one of them, he had to hide in a, in a trash can for a couple hours because they have the fucking uh, block on lock. <laughs> I always wanted to be in the military as a child, as a kid. Um, since I was a little boy, I just, I, I looked up to military uh, uniform, people in uniform, I looked up to the service. And so I kind of knew that was something I wanted, I was gonna get into. And I actually had a, an uncle, um, he married into a family, he's white. Um, he was in the service too, uh, post Vietnam, and so, I was inspired by a lot of the things that he did. Uh, like uh, he lives out in Paris, California, and uh, he had guns. He had like the area to do things. Growing up, I knew that that was something that I would that uh, I gravitated to. It was either between the army or the Marines, pretty much. I remember a Marine recruiter had uh, already pretty much had his eyes on me uh, in senior year, and. Um, he would come around and uh, he would do things to try, try to get me to sign up. And I, I showed interest in it, I really did. And at that time, my mom was very against it, extremely against it. Um, she, she always thought the worst case scenario uh, of joining the military. Me and my mom, we kind of had like a kind of like a loose agreement. Like after I graduated high school, 
I would do school for a bit, and then if I still wanted to go, I would go. As I mean, this recruiter started to talk more about what it would be like going in and, and getting the contract that I wanted. Um, for some reason, I had the understanding that I wasn't guaranteed the job I wanted in the Marine Corps. And that was a big, a big uh, decision uh, factor for me uh, because I, w I knew that I just wanted to be um, front lines. I went, to, I went to college for about a year, and this was back in 2009. The war is going on, and I remember vividly just seeing like CNN and and uh, things about troops um, being killed or certain things, certain fights. Um, and I just remember thinking like, I, I want to be there. Like I have, I have to be there. And so after that first year of college, I just realized that I didn't want to be where I was at. I went to the army recruiter and started asking questions. I uh, I told my mom I was I was going to do that, and she. She got really mad and let me know um, how she would feel if I actually followed through. And I ended up following through like a week later. She literally didn't talk to me for a week. Like living, living at, at home with your mom, uh, my mom literally gave me the cold shoulder. I have a younger sister, okay? I grew, I grew up uh, mom, dad, and a younger sister. She's three and a half years younger than me. When I left to the army, I severed that relationship with my sister. Me and my sister are like really close. When I took off, she was going to high school. So she went through that high school experience without having her brother. Now that we're older, like, we don't have the same relationship that we used to have. And we kind of try to look back to the origin of it. And it was just that time of absence. She kind of, like, took it as a betrayal because she also didn't want me to leave. And like I said, she went through stuff in high school that I just wasn't there for her. I would say I wanted to be a, a close-knit family, and, and things just kind of, um, kind of fell apart a little bit. And so now we don't we don't share the same experience. You know, just talking on the phone isn't the same. And then also vice versa with my mom. How my mom was so against it, of me going. Now she's just like super proud <laughs> to show a picture. You know, say, oh yeah, my son was in army. So following through my recruit my recruiting experience. It was actually pretty straightforward because I actually walked into the office and I started asking questions. And then uh, luckily I had my uncle for, that was a veteran. He kind of gave me the spill on like, don't fall for the bullshit. He actually came in with me too, actually. He came, he came with me. So once they seen that, they already knew like, okay, like I gotta be, I just gotta keep it real with this guy. Now he didn't BS me or fucking uh, uh, give, offer me the world. He just told me, you know, like, you're going to live an okay life. It's going to suck, you know. Um, if, you, if you go to these places stationed here, you're going to hate your life. If you go here and here, you're going to love it. Don't plan to get rich. I joined the delayed entry program, too. So I'd have to show up. I'd sign the contract, and I didn't ship out till three months later. So I'd have to show up to the recruitment office and, like, do PT with the Future Soldier program and uh, stuff like that. The way they have the Army is you have 30th AG, which is kind of like the processing center. Mm -hmm. And then you have actual boot camp where you actually get to your training unit and, uh, and you have your drill sergeant. 30th AG is literally like a fucking like a psych ward as far as like what you go through. You see all kind of shit. Everyone's yelling and everyone's hurried the fuck up. And um, no one really knows what the fuck is going on. You know, actually, you don't actually have a role, but you're just kind of like corralled into this thing. And uh, we had this uh, big black uh, drill sergeant named Drill Sergeant Beatty. He was fucking southerner, um, just big black and bald dude. And um, I remember at Chow Hall, um, when you were done at breakfast, you'd have to like stand up and sound off with like your roster number and to say something like you're done. So let's say, I don't remember what it was, but you'd have to sound off. And I remember, like, everyone just get fucking nervous, you know, because he'd have to hear you, and he'd, he'd point at you, be like, move out, you. And I remember certain dudes would just kind of, like, get up, and, like, they would stutter, and he, <laughs> he would be like, d -d 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 sit down, you try again, you. And, and I just remember thinking, like, like that was, like, I don't want to be that guy. You're fucking starving the whole time. You fucking you barely get to eat. So I actually got caught stealing food. 
I wasn't the only one, but I got caught stealing food. You get, you get up, you gotta go take your tray to, to dispose of all the food, and you, you're literally in line, you got all this food still on there, it's still edible. You got steak, you got fucking pieces of bread, you got an apple, all this. So what I would do is as I'm in line, I would look around, make sure no one was looking, and I would just grab whatever and just throw it in my pocket. And I had gotten away with it a couple of times. We get back to the barracks, you go upstairs to the, to the fucking restroom, and then you're just in there, just whatever you have. And sometimes you'd catch other dudes do the same thing. Like you'd, you'd catch someone in there doing the same thing you were doing. Uh, but this one time, I'm in line, and I, I grab a, uh, a piece of bread for the corner of his eye. Drew Sarn caught it. He just fucking called me out, fucking you. You know, just fucking chewed me up right there. I got to go back to the barracks, but he definitely let, he definitely let, um, let the platoon sergeant know what happened. And so we get back upstairs, and uh, in the army barracks, you have total line, which is like a big old rectangle, and everyone has to just literally put their toe to that line and stand up. So he's walking down the barracks, and he's literally talking about that situation. And uh, he's just, I remember him saying, like, today, we're going to make the wall sweat. We're going to make the wall sweat, boys. And so literally for the next hour and a half, literally doing push-ups, flutter kicks, up-down goes, fucking, you're doing everything, you know, everything. And I felt bad about it because I smoked the whole platoon, but everyone kept telling me, like, don't worry about it. Like, you, you just got caught. Everyone was doing it. You just wanted to got caught. There's another thing, um, going back to that reference with, the, with starving, uh, I remember some kid named Pimble. He was in third platoon. Um, he kept telling me, dude, you got to go to Jewish service. They got cake and pastries in the morning. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Like, yeah, they got cake and pastries in the morning. So Jewish service is on a Sunday morning, first service. So no one really goes because it's the first one. And there's not a lot of Jewish people in the service. We got a lot of Catholics, a lot of Christians, uh, but not a lot of Jewish guys. So. I show up and uh, sure as shit, fucking uh, right after mass, fucking they bring out the fucking folding, uh, folding uh, uh, table and they got donuts, they got fucking Twinkies, they got cake, they got, they got all this shit. They got juice and you're just like, damn, like, I can have some of this really? Like, and, and the whole time you're doing that, you're also just kind of keeping an eye for anyone that any drill sergeant from your unit that that may know, mm. that may that may know you, I, I went to that one, and then I would go like the next week, and I'll go the next week, and I got, it got to a point where I was telling people, uh, my other people in my unit, dude, you gotta go, you gotta go. I had a friend that was in another unit, and uh, I told him about it, and uh, by this time I was already like full fledged in it, and. Uh, <laughs> I had on an ACU yarmulke on my head. I, I, I ain't Jewish, but I, I got, I'm, I'm doing the Jewish thing. I remember uh, looking over to the hallway where the entrance is over here. I remember looking over and seeing my friend uh, Williams over I'm wearing this yarmulke on my head, ACU yarmulke. It's a pattern of the, the uniform. And he has this face on him that he's literally holding back tears, tears of laughter. He's literally looking at me and just like, <laughs> He, and service is going on, so it's quiet. So he's in there just looking at me and just making this face and making this face. And I look over, and now we got these two guys doing church giggles inside inside service. And uh, he's white, so he's turning red. And like he's literally like he he can't compose himself. He has to like walk away. And I remember thinking like, <laughs> I don't know. It just happened to be like a really funny story to me. I got orders to go to Fort Polk, Louisiana, which is like the fucking asshole of the army, as far as, as far as um, locations to be stationed at. With the 10th Mountain, 4th Brigade, uh, which is, it still doesn't make sense to have a 10th Mountain unit in Louisiana. There's no mountains. I get there and my unit is already deployed. My unit actually deployed while I was in boot camp. So they have rear D. We go to brigade to get our, our uh, our orders to go to what battalion we're going to. You have 525, which is field artillery. You got 389, which is cav. And you have uh, 24 and 230, which are the two infantry battalions. 
And then I went to 230. Me and this other guy went to 230. It was just two of us. I remember being in brigade and they're calling out, they're giving our orders. And uh, when they said that we we're going to 230, some 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 person in, in, the, in the room made a gesture like, damn, like, good luck with that. Like, they're getting fucked up over there. He didn't say fucked up, but he said something like, like, they're they're getting they're getting it in, in over there. Me as a private, uh, it just it kind of struck with me like shit like you know I'm going I'm going overseas I'm gonna go do this thing, and to be completely honest I didn't feel necessarily the best prepared straight out of boot camp going overseas because you know everyone knows basic is basic you learn the basic, but there's more intensive training that you need to do, and so I remember. Uh, on the van ride from brigade to battalion, you got the CQ runners uh, giving us a, a ride to, to battalion. And I remember asking one of the corporals, hey, is it really that bad as he's saying? He kind of looked at me, he just kind of like, he kind of like nodded, but he didn't really say much. Walking to battalion and um, S1, S1 room. And then all of a sudden uh, this fucking Staff sergeant, oh, I didn't even know the staff sergeant, but this dude with the high and tight, short white guy with the high and tight haircut comes up and just fucking locks me up at parade rest. He fucking starts yelling at me and, and telling me, who the fuck said that about, about what we just said about overseas? He's just literally going in on me. You better fucking tell me the name of that fucking person. And literally I'm just like locked up, like just fucking sh shook. Shook, I, it's my first experience getting to my unit and they're fucking hemming me up over something that I heard and I just had a question. And so, you know, I pretty much, I told him like, I don't know, I don't know the person's name. I just told him like, you know, this is what he looked like. And apparently he went, he went over there to fucking, to shit on that, shit on, on those people because uh, it just kind of gave a really bad impression of the situation. And I was that guy. I was that, amongst all of us, new privates, I was that guy that got fucking yelled at first day. Two weeks later, I was, I was, on, I was on a plane to Afghanistan. At that time, the war was still going on pretty crazy. And um, they had uh, Rear D was full of people that were getting out, people that, that were getting kicked out, and the broke dicks, people that, got, that were injured. Um, had medical reasons, and then all the guy, all the late deployers, I just got out of boot camp. So I was, you know, I was in that mix, and uh, we had dudes with casts going overseas. Like literally, you got a fucking cast on crutches. You're fucking going. Um, you may not fucking be in combat, but you're gonna do something. There was this dude uh, named Wingate. He was a big, big dude. I don't know what the situation was, but he got really fucking fat, like really fucking fat. Uh, like he shouldn't have been in the army fat. He had asked, can, can, I, can I stay back and lose some weight? I'm like, fuck no, you're gone. You're fucking gone. Every swing and dick is gone. When we got back from deployment, he, was, he, he lost all that weight. You don't want to stay back because you, you're kind of robbed by that experience of like wanting to fucking do the deed. Showed up in uh, April. The unit has one fob, fob Baltimore, and then you have all the cops. So you have Cop Kerwar, which is uh, Delta. You got uh, uh, Cop Shark, which is Bravo. Cop uh, BBK, Brocky Brock, which is Charlie. And then Alpha, um, they were actually attached to a whole different unit. They, they went somewhere else. So with the FOB, you got pretty much everything you need. You got fucking running water. You know, they got fucking internet. They got a nice chow hall. They got a decent places to, to sleep in. And then the cops are literally uh, a smaller version of that. I actually was never stationed to a cop. I, I was sort of unlucky and lucky. Um, I was based out of the FOB, but I would do rotations on a small fire base, a JSS, a Joint Security Station. Um, literally 80 meters by 80 meters. It's a fucking box. And uh, that shit was primitive, like nothing. You had like no running water. Um, you had no communication with the outside world, and you literally lived in the dirt uh, for the first for the first half until we built it up. But it was yeah, it was pretty shitty. I mean, they were dicks, but they weren't like they weren't gonna like try to tr give me the basic treat the boot camp treatment overseas. They were just gonna um, just kind of see what I know. And ultimately, I didn't know a lot of shit, so they would fucking smoke me a lot. They would fucking I would I would, I would fuck up a lot. 
So the first time I went out, I went out as a driver for an MRAP and uh, MATV, and um, uh, I had literally like minimal training on it, like like minimal training. And so we're going out. I'm the I'm the driver. My squad leader, he's a TC, and uh, we got the gunner. We got two guys in the back, and uh, we're uh, we're going out the day after we had heavy rain, heavy like there was literally heavy. Uh, in Afghanistan, it, it rains like it's the end of the world, like it, it floods. And so we're going out and uh, we start encountering a lot of fucking uh, like washed out roads. I remember getting to a river that was flowing really heavily and, uh, and uh, trucks were getting stuck. Trucks were getting stuck and we were pretty much compromised our position, you know, uh, being sick and ducks. And so I remember it's my truck, my turn, my truck's turn to, to cross the river. Platoon Sergeant, Sergeant First Class Kerry come up to me. He uh, opens the door and he yells at me. He just tells me, you better not fucking stop. You better not fucking stop. If you fucking stop, I'm gonna fuck you up. Um, and so he just kind of put that fear in me, like you better just fucking go. Fucking, I told the gunner, hold on, hold on. And so I just hit, I hit it and anything that was not tied down, in, in the truck went up in the air. The rifles went up in the air. I was up fucking fast and how hard the impact was to going through that fucking river. We made it, we made it through the river. And the first mission, that first time I went out was just actually going to establish that JSS I was telling you about, that fucking 80 by 80 um, meter compound. Um, that was gonna literally be our, our base within the enemy, enemy territory in, that, in those villages in that surrounding area. The first time I went out, I didn't get shot at. I actually didn't get shot out till like, maybe like a month and a half into country. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, and, and that's the thing about going overseas, that experiences vary. You don't, you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know where you're gonna go, if it's gonna be kinetic. Uh, some, some areas are more kinetic than, than others. And so that was my experience. It, it took me, it took me like a month and a half to, to actually get in a firefight. First firefight is uh, we're, we're already establishing the JSS and we're now doing patrols out into the surrounding villages and just showing a presence. And um, back then, I feel like going on patrols, like you were literally just asking it, just like, hey, we're here, come shoot at us. You know, we, we'd go out with always with an a and element, a and uh, Afghan National Army um, platoon or something. and. Uh, we just we'd go out and, and we just show presence. And uh, I remember I was I was probably like in like third squad, so I was kind of towards the towards the towards the back. And uh, we're walking we're walking in a in a in a wadi, which is kind of like a gully or like a dried up river. And we start walking up into this. Uh, we start we start walking up uh, over this kind of like small hill, and then it turns flat after that. And then there's a village right there. And um, I remember uh, being told that you always get shot before you get to a village as you're, going, as you're approaching or as you're leaving. Usually that's how it goes. Some, it sometimes happens while you're there, but usually it happens before or after. And um, I remember we're climbing, we're climbing, we're climbing up, and I remember hearing shots going off, but I didn't know there were shots. To me, it sounded like those small red firecrackers that you blow up in 4th of July, or the ones that you were able to get that come in a pack. Uh, I remember vividly thinking like, that's what, that's what I thought it was. And um, I remember thinking like, damn, like, that's what it sounds like get shot at. And so at that point, everyone's just kind of bounding up and trying to find a position to, to start shooting back. And that's what we do, we get, we get up on the berm, we start shooting back. People are just saying fucking corner of that building they're shooting or fucking uh, fucking 11 o'clock over here. And so you're just laying down rounds trying to uh, establish a superior firepower. I remember it, it was, they were, they were uh, reciprocating the same amount of firepower that we were to them. And so I had a, I had a 320 grenade launcher at the time. Yeah, I started letting that shit go. <laughs> I started letting that shit go. I didn't let anyone know that I was going to do it. So when I when I fired the first round and it and it impacted, people were like, "What the fuck was that? What the fuck was that?" 
And they were like, no, it's just Trinidad, Trinidad, you know, shot to 40 Mike Mike. And, uh, and uh, no one got hit that, no one got hit that one time. And I remember thinking like, uh, I, was, I was happy. I was, I was literally smiling from ear to ear because uh, being an infantryman, you want to experience that trial by fire. You want to be uh, baptized by fire, they call it. I was happy, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get a kill or anything like that, but I was just happy to be in that situation. And we actually did hit some guys, um, but I, did, I didn't. But I remember once we, uh, we got to the village and we got to court on the whole area, there was like uh, piles of uh, puddles of blood around, around areas where they had uh, spell, uh, spent shell casings. And we started like grabbing just anybody that looked suspicious and interrogating them. There was this one dude had the green uh, man jammas and uh, he had some fucking Nike, Nike shoes. And there was like a little bit of blood spout, splatter on them. And we, we knew like this guy, he was, he was in it. <laughs> and uh, I remember one of, my, one, of, one of the guys was like, yeah, that motherfucker for sure was in it. Look, he's got this go fast on, which is the shoes. Cause he can fucking run, run fast with those shoes. Cause most of them wear sandals. So that guy was for sure. And I remember he grabbed him and just fucking brought him over and just fucking slammed him onto the ground. They arrested him, but then then they let him go because they couldn't really do anything. They just fucking scanned his face, um, scanned his eye, put him in the system, and then I think they let him go. It's fucking exhilarating, you know? Like, your heart's racing, your ears are ringing, because fucking um, back then, no one really wore ear protection. Specialist Saul, Specialist Saul, he got shot leaving the village. So, Specialist Saul, was part of Charlie Company. And I met Specialist Saul up in the guard tower maybe like two days before I went on patrol. Usually there's one guy per guard tower and I was up there and this specific day, we had like higher ups coming in um, just to kind of check out the area. And so now they just beefed up security and now you had two guys up there. And I remember me and this guy, white dude, um, he's Polish. A Couple of days later, we go out and one thing about me being a mortarman, I was kind of like a bastard child as far as like all the line platoons. I, my position, my job was to stay with the gun, the mortar gun on, 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 um, on the JSS. But we didn't shoot mortars a lot, unfortunately. And so we would just go out. We, I would attach myself with a platoon going out. This platoon was going out and I asked if they needed another gun. And they said, yeah, yeah, come on. So. I went on I went with these guys and um, I remember we we're doing a briefing right outside the mortar pit and uh, everyone just kind of like, just kind of getting a, a, a brief on where we're going and what to expect. And this had already been a village that we had been to before and it had been kinetic there before. I remember we're sitting there and it's like, this is like already like, month five or some for me or something like that and you're all ra you're all raggedy like you, nothing you got you you look fucked up you look like you've been living in the dirt our pants are notorious for like ripping on the crotch area it's just like this is what they did i'm just listening and i look over and i see saul and he's got a fucking big asshole on his fucking crotch <laughs> and that motherfucker ain't wearing no drawers <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's someone sitting in front of him and i just remember thinking like dude do not turn around <laughs> <laughs> we gotta turn around. So we go to this village and um, we're there for a couple hours. Nothing happens. We, we, we decide to come back. And as we're coming back, we're walking through an open field, an actual like a field where they farm. And these fields have like berms that are dry. And then where they actually grow their stuff, it's all muddy and wet, like, like muddy as fuck. So we're all walking on the, on the berms and we got maybe like uh, five, five to, five to seven meters in between person. And so we're walking, I'm in the back, I'm in the, I'm in the back and we hear uh, a burst of PKM fire, you know, automatic burst. We all get down and, and Saul was actually uh, behind me. He was, he was the guy behind me. And we just trying to establish, okay, where the fuck did we just get shot from? And uh, we established this from the rear. And so uh, we started shooting back. And I remember looking over and saw is not up, facing the dirt. And I remember um, going over and I can hear him moaning. 
like he was in pain. And so for a second, I was just like, fuck, he got, like, he got shot. And so I yell, I yell over to uh, my squad leader, Staff Sergeant Yarley, Staff Sergeant, fucking saw got shot. He fucking runs over, he fucking looks at him. He yells, fucking medic, medic runs over. And, and we're look, assessing the situation and he got shot in the back. The round went right underneath the plate, went right underneath the plate. And then it came out the front and it hit, actually hit the front plate and went out and down. And so as we turned him over, you can see his guts literally out. And uh, he, you know, he's fucking moaning and shit and squad leader just fucking yells at me. And he tells me, get that fucking gun up, get that fucking gun up. And, and I saw he was a, he was actually a M249 gunner. So I fucking grab his saw, I get up on the berm and I just start laying, I just start laying fucking pretty much half a drum, just fucking laid it out. You can see the guys moving uh, uh, along a tree line. At the tree line, there's like a, a, a river, like a small uh, wadi river going through. So they're in there and they're, they're maneuvering back and forth. And there's also a tractor and some livestock in that area too. So we're shooting back in that direction. I have the saw and I'm laying, I'm laying down with the saw. I look over to my right and I see uh, one of my buddies, he fucking, he, he pretty much fell and his barrel went barrel first into the dirt. And so he fucked his shit up. He fucked his shit up. I remember him like literally trying to fucking pull back the charging handle and it was all okay. It was fucked up. It was fucked up. So I have my M4 still. So I give him, I, I, I give him the saw and I take back my M4. I don't even know who we got the guys, but I know that we heard about destroying that tractor and, and killing the livestock in that direction. Saw got medic, medevac out. Um, and then I had to carry his plate carrier and his backpack back. And I remember when we finally got back to the wire, just, you know, you're literally fucking drenched in sweat. And, and, and I actually never saw a dude again. He went to Germany, I heard, and I never saw him again. Okay, we're talking about the time that I got dys dysentery during uh, a, a big brigade mission. And this is actually after Extortion 17 went down in Wardak. Wardak province. So this is literally right after uh, brigade have fucking put up, uh, uh, put together a mission to go out to the Chak Valley to pretty much like uh, fuck these dudes up in that area. Pretty much, pretty much it. Uh, we're going out of our our AO. We're going to another AO that that was not a part of our operation, and uh, it's me. It's three mortars. There's three three of us uh, from two thirty, and then three mortars from uh, two four, and then a bunch of fucking other guys from, from 389 Cab. And uh, we're gonna pretty much be uh, going on Chinooks and being inserted onto the side of a mountain. Before that night we go out, we we're at the big fob, fob shank. We decided to go to a restaurant on fob shank the day, the, the, the day before the mission. So we go to the restaurant. Apparently I, 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 pick, I picked the wrong steak <laughs> cause that night, that night there, uh, we uh we infill. Um, I got really sick. Like I got the shits really bad. That and on that mission, it was a five day mission, and we had to pack for five days. So we had to pack literally everything that we needed for five days: food, water, ammo, and we had to carry the mortar system with us, the 81 millimeter mortar system with us. So by the time I got putting all my shit together, I could not put that bag on by myself. That bag was so fucking heavy that I had to literally have it on the ground, I had to get up, sit, sit down and put it on, and then had someone grab me and help me pick it, stand myself up and, and walk. My rucksack was so fucking heavy, I, I couldn't do it. And I, I was only like, I was 145 back then. I was a little ass dude. And so I remember walking to the helicopters. It was maybe like a 10 minute walk. By the time I got to the line, I was literally like, I was in so much pain. I was literally like, literally just like this the whole time, like in so much pain, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Fucking ramps come down and the ramp is still like fucking like two, a foot or two foot off the ground. So I got to step up and fucking struggle to get up. By the time I get up in the helicopter and I find my seat, my rucksack is so fucking big, it takes up the seat. So for the next, 35 minutes, I'm literally 
floating. My rucksack is in the sea and I'm not even sitting down. I'm literally doing a squat for 35 minutes on, on the flight there. We land and uh, fucking it's pitch black. Now it's come down. I can fucking barely see. I'm fucking sweating. I'm like a fucking, I'm like a mess. I fucking, I'm a fucking mess. I fucking um, go down the ramp. You can't see. Uh, one thing about nods is they have no depth perception. So you can't even see how far something is. So what I think is a foot ended up being three feet. By the time I stepped down, I, I missed my step and my ankle fucking rolls. And then I actually rolled down the side of a small hill. Tumble, and because my, my rucksack is so heavy, it's actually fucking tossing me. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking tossing me. So um, by the time I fucking, I get up, I'm disoriented. I just kind of figure out where I'm at. Okay, I got to climb back up. So I climb back up. Come back up. It's like one in the morning, and we're gonna wait. We're gonna wait a couple hours till we start doing movement. So we're just we have outside security and we have the ele main element inside. So we're waiting. We're waiting, and uh, barely as the sun starts coming up, like over the mountains, I start getting this feeling like, oh man, like I gotta go. Find a spot, I fucking go out. It's still dark, so I, I'm okay. I find a spot behind a rock, and I fucking go. I come back. Five minutes later, literally the same warm, heavy stomach feeling comes back. And I'm just like, damn, I, like, uh, this can't be happening. I fucking go again. Within, that, within those 30 minutes, I had gone already like four times. Oof. Yeah. At that point, I'm just like, I'm not feeling good, but... Hey, we got we got we got we got to do what we got to do. Fucking sun, fucking uh, sunlight comes, day comes, daylight comes. We start building our mortar pit. We start fucking digging, filling sandbags, digging, filling sandbags. It's fucking hot now. Now that same feeling comes again, and it's coming. Like I said, every 15 minutes, every 15 minutes is coming. I gotta fucking go. Now it's now it's daylight, and the enemy knows we're there. And now they're shooting mortars at us, trying to fucking zero in our position. So while they're shooting mortars and small arms fire, I'm behind a boulder, literally shitting up, pissing on my ass the whole time. And there's nothing I can do about it because, at that, yeah, at that point, I'm combat ineffective. I end up getting, I end up becoming like a heat cat. I get, I get really dehydrated from all the diarrhea. And uh, I end up uh, uh, staying with the medics for a little while. I had to get a shot. To get uh, hydrated back, how to get an IV, and um, um, after that was all said and done, I got back to my to my squad, and they just you know they made fun of me. <laughs> Definitely the food. So there was another time where we're actually uh, on our trucks and we're heading back to the FOB from the JSS um, on this road that we travel pretty frequently. Um, I'm in the MRAP. I'm on the passenger, um, and uh, we get a we get a uh, we get over the radio. Hey, uh, there was just an explosion underneath your truck, and it was it actually we didn't even feel it. You can smell like something burning when we get out. Uh, we get out and look, and uh, yeah, sure as shit. There's a fucking hole and a bag with the ID the ID stuff they put in. Apparently, the initial charge went on, but not the actual explosion and all. So our first class Temple gets out and he starts looking at it and he literally fucking grabs his knife and starts poking at it and shit. I remember thinking like, this motherfucker crazy. It was, it was a lot of bad times, but it also wasn't always that bad. You definitely got to establish really good uh, friendships and relationships with, with people. I mean, to the point it becomes really intimate where you know things about their family, you know things about their goals or what they want to do when they get back. Everyone says something about when I get back, I'm going to do this. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to go here. At the time that I was overseas, planking was a thing. So I remember we would fucking go around and find like fucking stupid ass spots on the fucking JSS and just plank or fucking. <laughs> and, and you do that out of pure, pure boredom and necessity. Coming back for deployment, you know, you just kind of try to embed yourself into garrison garrison mode, which is hard. Uh, a lot of do struggle with it because 
you're kind of conditioned to 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 fight. You're conditioned to be on the lookout for things. You're conditioned to be um, vigilant. And you get back and it's not relaxed. People struggle with the standards sometimes because you're living in the shit for so much time and now you got to fucking do struggle with fucking being uh, in clean, clean uniform, you know? So um, alcoholism for sure was a big thing. You know, we got back and first week, you know, DUIs and shit. Um, I remember my unit actually got put into a no drinking um, policy for a certain amount of time because we had too many alcohol related incidents. I ended up getting a situation with another soldier where he got a DUI and I was with him and I had an open container. The unit already had multiple alcohol related incidents. So when that one happened, that was like the last straw. And uh, they put in a, a no drinking order for, for like about a month or two. And uh, I remember everyone being pissed, pissed at us. So you get, you get put it back into like training cycle and, and uh, regular PT and, and kind of building your belt, you're building yourself back up. We'd go out and we do PT. Not everyone is in the same shape. So you have some guys that, that struggle with, with running, some guys that struggle with the strength. And I remember we're doing a five mile run my platoon sergeant would have this rule if you fall out, you treat it like a casualty. We're like a mile out from, from, from our start point. And so this guy was a big dude, he was a big dude. Fell out and uh, I just kind of took it upon myself to, to pick him up and fireman, fireman carry him. And I did, but I did feel like a pop on, on the back, on my back. From that, from that moment on, I was never the same. It was just all because I was just trying to prove that we need to get this done. It got worse, it progressed and it got worse. And, and that happens to a lot of people in the service. You have these injuries and they're hard to kind of maintain because the training cycle is so intense. You literally have to take time off to take care of it. And to do that, it's kind of, it's frowned upon to do that because you appear to be weak. You know, you get to a point where your body's so worn and torn that you can't do it. The body I have now, I cannot do what I used to do back then. Physically, my body is a temple. It's fucking, it's falling apart. When I got out, I had a plan and it, it, it fell through. I had an interview lined up. I had testing lined up. I had a bunch of things lined up and uh, we didn't, we didn't move up there. We ended up moving back to California, me and my wife. And it just kind of fucked everything up. I ended up having to stay with my parents for a while. And uh, that's kind of that's kind of hard coming from having your own place to just now moving in with your family, with your parents. For about a year, I just kind of wandered. I just kind of wandered, partied. Uh, depression was a big one. Um, there was a, a serious lack of enjoyment of life. I actually didn't want to be back home. So I think, I think that also kind of buried me a little bit because I, I envisioned my life somewhere else. After that year, I, I ended up going to, an, I ended up getting to an apprenticeship and that just kind of redirected me in where I needed to be and where I'm at now. So I, I work with cranes. I build them, operate them, drive them. It's blue collar. I'm proud to do it. And uh, I'm proud that we build America. It's something that I actually can get up every day and, and look forward to doing. I actually struggle with it a lot. Uh, for me, um, relationships uh, affect the mental health a lot. One of the things about getting out and that I struggled with, uh, with transitioning was the loss of identity. Uh, you know, for, for for once in my life, there was something that I actually was really good at, that I actually enjoyed. I never saw the, the military as a career, but for sure while I was doing it, I definitely, I kind of lived for that shit. And getting out, now you don't, you don't, uh, you're no longer around that or that, that mentality. The people around you don't even think the way that people in the military think. And so, I struggle with connecting with people. I struggle with connecting with family members and friends. 
it, I had a hard time letting go for sure. Um, and it took me a couple years to finally decide that I have to treat it as a chapter in my life and a new chapter starts. The longer I hold on to it, the more I, I just reminisce, but it is not in a good way. It would affect my mood. It would affect depression, anxiety would happen. And, and that would carry on into the people that I treated and loved. It, it got to a point where I had to reach out and, and get uh, help, mental health. You know, counseling, actually, I'm a big advocate for it. I, I, I do it myself. I've done it myself plenty of time. And I think it's really important that um, that you actually get out there and speak to somebody. To this day, I still struggle with with uh, mental health. I still struggle with letting go of the past and, and, and forging a, a plan for the future. And what I do now is I stay in touch with other vets. Um, I dedicate myself to a trade or something that I actually enjoy. I try to um, work on relationships with people and um, connect with family. And for sure, um, fitness is a big thing. You got you got to stay fit. If you don't stay fit, you're gonna look at yourself like like a piece of shit. You know, if you if you if you feel look good, you feel good. Um, uh, I believe that's true. My work, what I do for a living now, it actually helps me out a lot with finding my purpose in life, repurpose from, from the military to what I do now. Uh, it gives me a sense of direction and I, I get to work with like-minded individuals in this kind of work that I do. And actually there's other vets that get into the business of what I do, which is operating heavy equipment, construction, construction uh, industry union. And um, I belong to uh, Local 12, and uh, they're always looking for vets. Vets are definitely something that the union wants because they know what kind of individual uh, a veteran can be. Uh, a go-getter, someone who's gonna be show up on time, someone who's actually gonna take pride in their work. For a vet, the best way to get in is to go through their apprenticeship and their apprenticeship will give vets a, a kind of a preference over the other candidates mm. simply because of what a vet will bring. When you get into this kind of trade, you actually make decent amount of money and you're actually doing something that you can actually gravi gravitate to and like and look at as a career. Some people decide not to pursue it as a career, but it's definitely a good stepping stone versus you know, getting out and doing like some bullshit security job or like working at a fast food place or some shit like that. And I'm not knocking anyone that does that, but um, I tend to notice that it it um, it uh, it brings more as an individual when you actually feel like you're doing something good for yourself and for others. I really push for other veterans to actually get out and um, get in touch with some of these veter veteran organizations like the VFW, the American Legion. Um, these organizations are, have been put in place, established way before us, all because of uh, returning back from service and maybe having, a, having trouble getting in touch back with, with society. Um, and these places, because they were established so, uh, such a long time ago, there is a generational gap between our veterans, our veteran generation now, and then the ones in the past, Vietnam, Korea, um, Desert Storm. And so it's important that we bridge that gap and we maintain that going because as these guys die out, the organization is dying slowly with them. And uh, I'm a member of, of a VFW um, at a Hawaiian Gardens. They take care of me, and when you go into this place, they literally tell you things like, you come in, he in here and if you leave your wallet there, it'll be there until you come back and get it. No one's gonna touch it. That's the kind of mentality of these places. And um, it's simply just there for the better to look out for each other. I, yeah, I just implore you guys to do that, to, to go out and get in touch with these, these places.